This is the word of the Lord. We are in John chapter 7, verses 1 to 13 today as we continue our series in John. Uh, John chapter 7, verse 1. After this, Jesus went about in Galilee. He would not go about in Judea because the Jews were seeking to kill him. Now the Jews' feast of booths was at hand. So his brothers said to him, Leave here and go to Judea, that your disciples also may see the works you are doing. For no one works in secret if he seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. For not even his brothers believed in him. Jesus said to them, My time has not yet come, but your time is always here. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me, because I testify it about it that its works are evil. You go up to the feast. I am not going up to this feast, for my time has not yet fully come. After saying this, he remained in Galilee. But after his brothers had gone up to the feast, he also, then he also went up, not publicly, but in private. The Jews were looking for him at the feast and saying, Where is he? And there was much muttering about him among the people. While some said, He is a good man, others said, No, he is leading the people astray. Yet, for fear of the Jews, no one spoke openly of them. This is the word of the Lord. Go and have a seat. Well, good morning, church. It is sweet to be together, isn't it? Man, it's good. It's packed. It's fun. It's tight, cramped. But I was just telling my bride and a few guys during the Family Five, when we're singing all together as the church and actually hearing each other's voices, it's a sweet sound, isn't it? where we're celebrating the grace of God, we're remembering it together, and we remember that we're not in this Christian life alone. That's why we come to church, to be reminded of the gospel and to do it with other people that need reminding as well. Um, We are diving today back into the series that we've been in for a while, and we're going to continue in in the Gospel of John. As you saw in our reading, we're in John chapter 7. So I'm going to recap a little bit to be able to place us back in this. But before we do that, I want to mention something that Luke, Luke somewhere, that Luke mentioned during the the vision cast. There he is. Um, This last week, uh, it happened all of a sudden. Last Sunday, Mike Mayer was here back in GLK greeting everybody. Mike is a a member here at Gospel Life. He's been here for a while here at Gospel Life. He's a brother that we love, we care for. If you've come to Gospel Life once, you've been greeted by him during the Family Five. He's connecting people. He's the best. But last Sunday, right after that, he got pneumonia, and he went into the ER. They told him he had pneumonia. The next day, it turned bacterial. His organs started to go, well, his blood went septic. His kidneys started to shut down. And by Thursday, they were convinced that Mike was going to die. Like that. Like, in two days, we're losing our dad. Rob's dad, in two days, we're losing him. So all the doctors were saying, you're going to lose your dad. All the nurses are going to say, basically telling him, you're losing Mike. He's not going to make it. Of 30 people that have this, 29 of them will die. And the church came together. We gathered the members via Zoom, which praise God for technology. And we prayed from 8.15 to 8.30 via Zoom. And at about 8.40, we got a text from the Mayer family saying that Mike's levels were increasing and that he wasn't going to die. It's incredible what God does. We celebrate that as a church family. Because God chose to save our our brother. Um, We also trust that if God didn't choose to save him, that he would be in heaven with him. And that we'd celebrate that too, because we have security in Jesus. But we just share that with you because Mike usually sits right there. And Mike's going to be back, God willing, soon. And I want to invite you as a church, pray for his kidneys. His kidneys are having a hard time getting kick-started, and that's what they're praying for right now. But he's on the road to recovery by the grace of God. So we celebrate that. And we also want to thank you. We just finished up a series called The Church. We're talking about what it means to be the church. And the church came together and prayed, and it was sweet. So that's a wonderful celebration. So diving back into John, um, let's recap a little bit about where we're at in the Gospel of John. As I said, we have been in this for a while. We're going to be in it for a while as a church. Oftentimes, we read through books of the Bible at Gospel Life, and we like to go slowly. So we're in John chapter 7, and John chapter 7, verse 1, starts like this. It says, after this, Jesus went about in Galilee. Now, if you're new to this conversation, or maybe you, like me, forgot where we were even at in the Gospel of John, we did the series on the church, and I totally forgot. Here's a recap of where we're at. Right now, we are in the middle of what Bible scholars call the Book of Signs. In the Gospel of John, from chapter 2 all the way to chapter 11, they call it the Book of Signs. 
And they call it the book of signs because in the midst of these nine chapters, Jesus walks on water, Jesus feeds the 5,000, Jesus heals an official son, Jesus performs all these miraculous things that nobody has ever done before and nobody has ever seen since. And he's doing these things not because the signs are a big deal and not because he wants people to be obsessed with the story of him feeding 5,000, but because the signs were meant to point somewhere. This part of the book of John is Jesus authenticating his claims that he is the Son of God and that he's the Messiah. Rob shared with us as we started diving into this series that if I'm on my way to Disneyland with my family and I come to the sign that says Disneyland 10 miles ahead and I pull off and I set up a tent and I invite my kids to come out and say, welcome to Disneyland, they're going to be really frustrated at me because the sign isn't the point, but the sign points somewhere. This part of the Gospel of John is called the Book of Signs because everything that we're hearing and everything that we're reading and every single story is meant to point to belief in Jesus. The point isn't the sign. The signs are pointing to Christ. Here's some things that Jesus has said in this Book of Signs so far that we've heard, and just as a recap for us, Jesus said in John chapter 5, verse 36, For the works that the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works I'm doing, referring to the stuff that he's doing, they bear witness about me that the Father has sent me. John 6, 29. This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. And then John 6, 35. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. And whoever believes in me shall never thirst. The point of the signs and the point of the miracles and the point of the ministry of Jesus is not just to be interested in Jesus' church. It's not just to be associated with Jesus or to even be around other people that are interested in Jesus. The point is to believe in Jesus, to believe that he is God himself sent to seek and save the lost. The reason we're in this and our prayer for you as we're diving into this, we pray that this summer isn't a sleepy summer for you. We pray that this summer isn't just an opportunity to check out, but that as we're hearing about what Jesus has done and what he's accomplished, that you get enamored with and infatuated by and captured by who Jesus is because he is who he says he is. And it changes everything for us. We're not just meant to be interested in or associated with or around him. That's not what faith is. Faith is what John 21 tells us. This is the summary of the book of John and why we're in this series and what we're after in this text today. John 21 verse 30. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, And that by believing, you may have life in his name. Our prayer for you in the Gospel of John is that you would believe if you haven't yet. That you would believe again if you've forgotten or wandered. And that you would enjoy and grow and thrive in your relationship with Christ. Not because you know about him and not because you've been associated with him. And not because you're around other people that know him. But because you know him. Not religiously know him. Not through your routines know him. But you have a relationship by faith with him. That's why we're here, church. That's our prayer for you. And that's the invitation of this passage today. The reason I wanted to lay that context and lay that foundation is because of what this passage is talking about. I love the passage that we're in today because it's going to talk about one of the greatest threats that you and I will ever experience when it comes to our relationship with Jesus. We're going to see one of the greatest threats, the greatest challenges, one of the greatest obstacles that we'll ever encounter to having a thriving relationship by faith with Christ. This threat, it's not an external enemy. It's an internal one, and it's super sneaky. By its very nature, it's sneaky because you can't diagnose it on your own. If it was up to you, you'd never go to a doctor for this, but you actually see it in everybody else and want everybody else to deal with it. 
This threat has the ability not just to steal your joy and wreck your relationships, but more importantly, if this threat and obstacle to faith isn't confronted and confessed and changed through Christ, it'll send your soul to hell. That's how serious this is. The threat that we're talking about today is the enemy of self-righteousness. And this text today is thick with people that have been poisoned by it. Welcome to church. Let's talk about being self-righteous. Now, do you know what self-righteousness means? Anybody know? Now, that was a test. If somebody raised their hand, you might be self-righteous. If you're like, yeah, duh, of course I know. You're an idiot if you don't. Yeah, this message is for you. Self-righteousness has in its definition, or has in the word, the definition of the word. When you look at the word, it gives you the definition just by reading it. Self-righteousness means self-rightness. Self-rightness. It is the belief that I'm right, everyone else is wrong, and the world would be a way better place if everybody just did things my way. Anybody suffer from this disease? (laughs) Perfect. That's where you can raise your hands. (laughs) Today, we're going to read about self-righteousness. We're going to define self-righteousness. We're going to confront self-righteousness. And my prayer is that we see and get convicted of our own self-righteousness and walk in repentance away from it. When we learn that he's God, I'm not. He's right, I'm wrong. And life is way better when I just trust that. Luke and I were talking today. (laughs) We were saying that we should just call this whole month Self-Righteousness Awareness Month because we're going to be in this passage. (laughs) We're going to be in John 7, and it's going to keep building. We're going to double down on this. We talked about getting 500 little mirrors to pass out today that says, Jesus is right, I'm wrong, isn't it great? That's what we're talking about today. (laughs) We're talking about the disease and the poison of self-righteousness, but by God's grace, the remedy for it. Here's our big idea, and this is what we'll be unpacking. My self-righteousness can be redeemed when it's submitted to Jesus' way, Jesus' will, and Jesus' glory over my own. That's what we're unpacking. I pray that you skip out of this place shouting this, Jesus' way is better than my way, Jesus' will and plan is better than my plan, and my life is submitted and surrendered to him. That's our prayer. That's what this passage is after, so let's get after it. Verse 1, let's get back to the passage. After this, Jesus went about in Galilee. He would not go in Judea because the Jews were seeking to kill him. The biblical context of this, for us to be able to unpack this a little bit, Jesus has performed the majority of his miracles north of Jerusalem around the Sea of Galilee. When you think about the miracles of Jesus and all the things that Jesus has done, the majority of them didn't happen in Jerusalem which is a little bit strange when you think about it. Jesus didn't go to the epicenter of the Jewish world to be able to do all these signs. In our wisdom, it would make sense. Go to the loudest, most visible stage. Put your majesty on display. That's going to give you the most cred. He didn't do that. Jesus went north up into Galilee. He heals the official's son in the region of Galilee. He transforms water into wine in the region around Galilee. He's doing it in the podunk. He's doing it in the outside towns. He's doing it not in the epicenter, but he's doing it on the outskirts. He's doing this for a purpose. He walks on the Sea of Galilee, doing that miracle to the north for a purpose. Jesus came, and Jesus didn't come to a castle. He came to a cradle. He lived the majority of his life being humbled instead of honored. He did that because he got low with sinners and sufferers, and he lived a perfectly humble life. And he did this because this is the plan of his father. And right now, he's ministering and healing and helping people in the region of Galilee. And this text tells us one of the reasons why. Why is he doing it here? What's what's he doing? Why doesn't he just go to Jerusalem? The passage says in verse 1, Because the Jews were seeking to kill him. It's really important when we start talking about self-righteousness that we understand that Jesus' miracles and Jesus' message were massively offending to the Jewish leaders at this time. The Pharisees at this time were super offended by Jesus, and here's why. In John chapter 5, Jesus healed a man on the Sabbath. Jesus didn't break God's law in doing this, but he was breaking the artificial laws that the Pharisees had set up to puff themselves up and to control everybody else. That's what self-righteousness does, church. 
It puffs me up, makes me think that I'm good according to my standards, and it penalizes everybody else according to the standard that I obviously meet. The Pharisees were the kings of this. They created an artificial, extra-biblical, extra-law standard that they applied to everybody, and they're trying to apply it to Jesus. And Jesus heals a man on the Sabbath, and John 5, 16 says, this is why the Jews were persecuting Jesus, because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. Healing a man. Now, if somebody healed a man, like took a man who was an invalid, crippled for many, many years, for decades, we would rejoice and celebrate. The Jews were frustrated. The Pharisees wanted to kill him because of it, because he broke their laws. That's what self-righteousness does. Jesus was also telling people that he was the son of God, and the Jews hated it. Jesus was God's son, but the Jewish leaders didn't want to bow to anybody or submit to anyone, so they started forming a plan to place a hit on Jesus because he claimed to be God. John 5.18 tells us that. This was why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was calling God his own father, making himself equal to God. As we talk about self-righteousness, we start in the story with Pharisees that are trying to kill Jesus because they wanted to control him. They thought that he was threatening their throne and they wanted to out him because of it. But when we think about self-righteousness, it's super easy to spot in Pharisees. When we think about self-righteousness, we think about the prideful person that puffs themselves up, penalizes other people, and in the case of the Pharisees, crucifies the king of creation because he threatened their throne. Their self-righteousness is obvious. It's over, it's loud, it's obnoxious. But that's not the type of self-righteousness that this passage is talking about. It's really easy to spot it in somebody else. But the type of self-righteousness that this passage is talking about is a little bit more sneaky than that. And we got to pay attention because it's going to show up in just a second. Verse 2. Now the Jews' feast of booths was at hand. We're going to pause there for just a second before we get to really the thrust of this passage. Bible geeks. Any Bible geeks? Anybody out there? You guys know what the feast of booths is? The Feast of Booths is an eight-day festival that happened once a year where every Jewish male was told to go into Jerusalem and People came out from the woodworks, thousands of people coming and descending on the city. And here's what they did for eight days. They set up shacks in Jerusalem, and they set up tents all around the cities. And they left their homes, and every person in the city lived on the streets. It's kind of like Coachella for Christians. It's crazy. (laughs) Anybody ever went to Creation Fest growing up? It is like Creation Fest. Bunch of people coming together, and they're leaving their homes, and they're having a party, living in tents. It's Christian Coachella. The reason they did this is because all the way back in Leviticus, God instructed them to do it. Why? Well, he wanted them every single year to remember what their forefathers went through. Their forefathers for 40 years wandered around in the wilderness, living in tents, living in manufactured set-up shacks, and all through that season of being displaced, do you know who was faithful? God was faithful. Do you know who provided for them? God provided for them. He led them by a pillar of fire during the night and a pillar of cloud during the day. He fed them with bread from heaven and quails dropping out of the skies. God was faithful. And God in Leviticus says, I want you to remember this because I'm faithful. And I want you to come together every year and celebrate that. So they would have parties and festivals. And for eight days, they would do this, remembering God's faithfulness. Thousands of people gathering. This was the place to to be, and most Jews in the area would descend upon Jerusalem. This was the loudest stage possible that Jesus could have put his glory on display on, and yet he chooses not to, and we'll learn in just a second. Verse 3, so his brothers, knowing that this feast of booths was at hand, his brothers said to him, leave here and go to Judea, that your disciples also may see the works that you are doing. Let's pause there for just a second. Do you guys know that Jesus had brothers? He had brothers. John 2.12 tells us that. James, Jose, Simon, and Jude. Jesus had brothers. The Son of God lived in a home with other brothers. But it's interesting. We learn here in this passage that Jesus' brothers had an agenda that competed with Jesus' agenda. 
Back in verse 1, John tells us that Jesus wasn't going south to Judea because the Jews were seeking to kill him. It wasn't time for that. His brothers are saying, we want you to go to Judea, that your disciples would see your work. Verse 3, they said, leave here and go to Judea, that your disciples also may see the works that you're doing. Now, we have to ask the question what their motivation here for this is. Why are they telling him to do the thing that he wasn't doing? What's their agenda and why is it competing? We have a few options. Back in John 6, we just read this before we started the series in the church, Jesus lost a ton of followers. Did you guys know that? Jesus said some hard things. He had crowds starting to follow him. He was feeding people, and people were coming out of the woodwork. And then in John 6, he says some really hard things, and it says that a bunch of people left. Maybe Jesus' brothers, they were concerned with that, and maybe they wanted to be able to get more numbers to follow Jesus again. Maybe they were Jesus' social media curators, and they were trying to get his numbers up because he lost a lot of people. Maybe they had intentions in mind that were honorable. That, That could be the case. Why would they want him to go to the place that he's chosen not to go. Maybe it was a good motivation. Maybe they wanted to give him a global platform because they genuinely wanted others to be impacted by Jesus's ministry. Maybe they actually want people to hear and experience Jesus, but that, that actually isn't the case as we continue reading. Their motives weren't pure. Their motives were selfish, and here's why. It says, so his brother said to him, verse 3 and 4, leave here and go to Judea that your disciples also may see the works you are doing. And here it is. For no one works in secret if he seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. In other words, if you are who you say you are, prove it. It sounds innocent. It's not. Jesus' brothers were placing expectation and demands on Jesus about what he should do and where he should go and how he should operate. And it says in verse 5, the reason why, for not even his own brothers believed in him. These guys grew up with Jesus. They were around Jesus. They saw Jesus' interaction. They knew that he was sinless, either by them knowing it, or they probably weren't able to admit it, but they saw the way that he interacted and the way that he behaved. They heard the words of Jesus. They saw his life up front and personal. And yet, observation, church, isn't the same thing as salvation. Can I get an amen to that? They rejected the plan and purpose of the Messiah because they thought they knew better. They observed Jesus, but they didn't believe in Jesus. They didn't know him. They refused to acknowledge that he was who he said he was, and they resisted to surrendering to him as Lord of their lives. Here's why we're taking time to articulate this and to see it in God's word. If Jesus' brother suffered from the disease of self-righteousness, we got to talk about it too. These guys had an up-close and personal perspective on the Son of God, and yet there was something going on in their hearts, something going on in their lives, something that was impacting them that had blinders over them, that kept them from submitting and surrendering and trusting, and they're trying to manipulate the Son of God. They're trying to control him. They're making demands on him. They're saying our way's best, follow what we think, They're talking to the king of creation. Do you think we got to talk about this? I think so. Here's what self-righteousness is. Self-righteousness, we got a slide for this, is demanding, controlling, manipulative, domineering, patronizing, bossy, smug, and ignorant. Anyone convicted yet? Self-righteousness, self-right, thinking that I know best, that I should be in charge, that the world would be way better if everybody just did things my way. It's those things, because that's what Jesus' brothers are doing to him. They're demanding that he do things on their terms. They're trying to control him. They're actually even manipulating him, trying to gaslight him, trying to make him do the thing that they wanted him to do in order to prove himself. They're being domineering, trying to take charge in the conversation. They're patronizing him. He's the son of God, and they have the gall to say what they think is best. They're being bossy, smug, and they're ignorant. That's what our self-righteousness is. 
When we think about self-righteousness, it's easy to point out in others. I asked a few people that are close to me at Gospel Life to be able to talk about what this looks like in them. Because if that list isn't convicting and doesn't paint a picture, I want you to hear what this looks like in, in the hearts of people that are sitting next to you this morning. And then we'll get to what it looks like in you and in me. This is what self-righteousness sounds like. Somebody shared with me this week. Wow, my teenage son is so sinful. He just doesn't learn from his mistakes. It is so painful watching him be so stupid. I'm glad I had it pretty much together when I was a teen. I was so easy for my parents. If he was just more like me at this age, his life would be so much better and mine would be too. That's what it looks like. That's what it sounds like. It's a disease of self. And that's what it looks like when it comes out. Another person said, I get self-righteous when I've been wronged and I refuse to accept someone else's apology because it wasn't good enough in my opinion. Anyone ever been there? The problem with my self-righteousness is that I'm not aware of it, someone shared. I think everything I do is right. (laughs) Duh. (laughs) And everyone else does everything wrong. (laughs) Jesus, please forgive me. Another person said, I get self-righteous when I see people or families in hard circumstances because of their own choices, and I think I'd never let my kids experience that. (laughs) In reality, that could be me apart from the grace of God, but I don't see it that way. Another person shared, I look to and judge the sins of other Christians to puff myself up, specifically the people I'm jealous of or envious towards. My self-righteousness causes me to talk bad about them behind their back and justify it. Self-righteousness is the refusal to admit that you're wrong, and it's the rejection of an apology when it's not good enough for you. Self-righteousness is judging others around you by your standard and penalizing people when they fall short of your expectations. Self-righteousness is being critical of a friend, judgmental of a leader, manipulative of your kids, smug towards your coworkers. It's judging someone else's politics, preferences, style, and speech, and it's being convinced that you're right without any room for debate. Self-righteousness is self-appointed rightness. I'm right about my parenting, my politics, my driving, (laughs) my social media use, my business practices, my GC style and preference. Everybody else is wrong. The world would be so much better if everyone just listened to me and did what I said. Anybody guilty of that this morning? (laughs) Jesus' brothers are a prime example of it. Jesus' brothers place demand on Jesus' plan. They judged Jesus' motives. They patronized Jesus' methods. They tried to control Jesus' decisions. And they attempted to manipulate Jesus into doing what they wanted rather than submitting to what Jesus wanted. Do you see the problem yet? Here's three things that self-righteousness is if it hasn't yet hit. Self-righteousness is deceiving. It doubts and it always destroys. Self-righteousness deceives, doubts, and destroys. There's a quote from a guy named Trevin Wax. He's an author on the Gospel Coalition. He said this, and I just love it. He said, self-righteousness stinks. Unfortunately, we're the last to smell it on ourselves. (laughs) Man, he actually got that from Proverbs 30, verse 12. God's word said that. That's in a different way. But it says in Proverbs 30, 12, there are those that are clean in their own eyes but not washed of their filth. Have you been deceived by your self-righteousness? You can't see it on your own. You won't diagnose it in yourself. You'll see it in everybody else around you. I'm telling you, this week in my life, I had a wonderful opportunity to spend more time with my kids than I was expecting. (laughs) Now, that, that sounds horrible as a parent to say, but let's just be honest for a second. My lovely wife had the privilege of being at the hospital with Nick and Alora when they had their baby. Uh, She's a labor and delivery nurse, and Emily was there helping them. And I had the great opportunity to be with my kids for longer than I expected. What happened in my heart is that when I'm with my kids, my way goes. I'm in charge because I'm king, and I run a tight ship. And if anybody else starts getting in the way of my plans and my structure and my rhythms, I lose it. I like become a bowling ball and a steamroller and I just plow through anybody else that's around me in order to make sure that I have peace. That's what happened in my heart this week. And in the moment, I didn't notice it. 
because I'm right and everyone's wrong. And yet I went to bed thinking, why am I so stressed? Why am I so anxious? Why do I feel so overwhelmed and like there's just tension in me and like I just want to eat so much ice cream right now? Why? What's happening? It's deceiving me. The two tools that God uses in my life to expose my self-righteousness are his word and his people. That's the scalpel that he uses to show someone who's deceived by self-righteousness that they're being self-righteous. Hebrews 4.12 says that God's word cuts. It's alive and active. It's sharper than any double-edged sword. And it cuts to your heart and it divides the thoughts and intentions of your heart so you actually know what's going on. God's word is that. I remember when I was going to school down in California, getting my master's degree, we were talking about 1 Peter 3, 7, and it says, Husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way. And I remember reading that and talking about it, and before that, I thought I was the best husband ever. I'm like, you're blessed by being married to me. This is great. <laughs> and I read that, and I'm like, oh man, every time Emily's trying to describe what she's experiencing to me, or every time she's sharing her thoughts and emotions, I go to control, fix, problem solve, and I stop listening to you. And I read that, and we're talking about it, and I had to come home and repent, because I'm like, I'm selfish to the core. And I thought I was awesome. It was God's word that cut me. His word is the scalpel that reveals your self-righteousness. Have you been in it lately? The other tool that God uses is his people. People that know you, that choose to be around you, that see enough of the pattern of your life to call you out when you're being dumb. I'm so grateful for people at Gospel Life that have come to me and said, Kyle, it seems like you're trying to control the circumstance. Or Kyle, it seems like you're bulldozing somebody. Or Kyle, it seems like you're withdrawing or hiding and getting quiet because you're disagreeing right now. I'm so thankful for the church. But the question is this, have you been in God's word lately? Are you around God's people lately? How are they showing you this disease in your flesh? If not, I would argue that you've done the one thing to keep you safe. You've removed the tools that God uses to tell you you're wrong because you don't want to be. If you're not in God's word and if you're not in God's people, you're making a choice to say I'm always right because there's nothing that can stand against your pride. Self-righteousness deceives if you're not in his word, if you're not around his people, you're losing. You stink and you don't smell it. We all suffer from it, every one of us. But it'll be sneaky and we won't be able to catch it on our own. Self-righteousness deceives. Number two, self-righteousness doubts. Why do we know this? I love that John in this passage tells us the motivating factor in the disciples' patronizing, controlling, demanding tone with Jesus. We oftentimes don't get a window into the heart of the author or of the, the characters in a Bible story, but John gives us the window into their heart because he wants us to see what's at the root of self-righteousness. It says that they said these things. They did this because they did not believe that he was who he said he was, for not even his own brothers believed in him. Church, the root of self-righteousness is unbelief. Jesus' brothers demanded because they doubted. Your demands will expose your doubts. I'm going to say that again. Our demands expose our doubts. Said another way, our lack of grace reveals our lack of faith. I want you to think about this. Where in your life are we making demands? If you make statements like, if you listen to me, then I'll love you. Sat in marriage counseling two weeks ago and I heard someone say, if you just listen to me, then I'll love you. Okay, that sounds right. Yeah, I, I want to be listened to. But what's that saying at the core? That's saying, I'm demanding that you listen to me because I don't believe that God hears me every time I cry out to him. And you are my God and you're failing me. So I'm going to penalize you instead of running to him because he always hears me and he loves me. Our demands expose our doubts. If Jesus gives me what I want, I'll do what he says. If he gives me a good spouse, gives me a good job, heals my mom, fixes my living situation, makes my life better and easier, then I'll live for him. Boom! Self-righteous. 
I bargain with God when I don't believe he's good, when I don't trust that he is who he says he is, when I don't believe that he wants good for me for his glory. The root of self-righteousness in Jesus' brothers was unbelief, and it's the same for us. What are your demands revealing about your doubts? Think about that. You're making any demands. It's a window into your heart. It's not about the other person. James 4 says your fights are about you. It's about your heart. Self-righteousness deceives, self-righteousness doubts, and then finally, self-righteousness destroys. And we got to start with bad news before we get to wonderful news, and it's coming, I promise. But we have to see the weight of this. Self-righteousness destroys your enjoyment of Jesus every day. Self-righteousness destroys your intimacy with Jesus every day. Self-righteousness will shipwreck our obedience to Jesus. It's sneaky, it's blinding, it's deceiving. It's a poison to our soul that tells us that everybody else is the problem and that I'm good all the time, even when I'm not. Church, self-righteousness, if it's not confronted and confessed and surrendered and changed through Jesus Christ, will derail and shipwreck every relationship in your life because you're constantly focused on somebody else being the problem and never willing to admit that you are too. Who's the problem? Me! Me. (laughs) It's me! I'm a problem. There's 99 problems. I'm every one of them. I have all of them. All of them. It's my heart. And I wander constantly. But self-righteousness, it'll deceive you and tell you that's not true. It comes from unbelief. And if you don't catch it, it'll destroy you. Here's the amazing news about this incredible passage. We're going to read, go to verse 6, and then... Hear why Jesus' response is such good news. For everyone suffering from the disease of self-righteousness, for these brothers that were poisoned by it and they couldn't see the Messiah and weren't willing to surrender to him because that's what brothers do, but more so because in their heart they were prideful and arrogant. Jesus said to them, even though they tried to control him and even though they tried to manipulate him, verse six, my time has not yet come. But your time is always here. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify about it that its works are evil. You go up to the feast. I'm not going to go up to this feast for my time has not yet fully come. And after saying this, he remained in Galilee. Would it make perfect sense for Jesus just to rail his brothers at this point? Brother, any brothers in the room? Would you rail your brother? when they disagree with you, when they confront you, when they challenge your authority. Yeah, you would. Jesus has every right to destroy them right now because they're controlling him, because they're manipulating him. He'll do the brother punch and sock him in the face and would be justified in doing so. And yet, that's not how he responds. How does he respond? He tells them that his agenda is the polar opposite of their agenda. Where his brothers demanded that Jesus work on their timing, Jesus says, my timing is perfectly submitted to the Father, and I only do what he says. Where Jesus' brothers wanted Jesus to prove himself with popularity, Jesus didn't need to prove himself to anybody, and he persevered even in the face of great persecution. Where his brothers wanted to manipulate him and gaslight him and control him to do what they wanted, Jesus knew what his Father wanted. And he wouldn't cave to pressure from anybody, even his own brothers. As we get down into the story in verse 10, Jesus does go up to the festival. Did you guys know that? He actually ends up going. He lets them go ahead and he sticks behind. Because if he chose not to go, it would be sin. Because in Exodus it says every Jewish male is supposed to go to Jerusalem for this feast. He ends up going and doing the thing, but not for the motive that his brothers wanted. For the motive that his father wanted. To be obedient. He would go down to Jerusalem, but he went down in private. He did it because God's law commanded him to, and he perfectly obeyed God's rules from his birthday to his death day. Why? Why didn't Jesus just punch his brothers? Why didn't Jesus just rail them for their insubordination? Why? Why did he respond humbly but obediently? Why did he respond graciously but firmly, being set on his course, not bowing to anybody? Jesus was right from his birthday to his death day because you and I have been horribly wrong and we need a substitute. We need someone to be right for us because you're wrong all the time and so am I. 
Jesus was perfectly right in every situation, in every response, in every single relationship. Perfect obedience, perfect surrender, perfect trust, perfect humility, perfect discernment, perfect rightness. He was always this way, is always this way, and will always be this way. But he came and he lived a human life of perfect rightness because you are horribly wrong. And so am I. And the miracle of the gospel is that the self-righteous and the self-sabotaging and the self-deceiving that suffers from the disease of self gets a substitute in Jesus Christ, their Savior. We get a rescue for our pride. We get forgiveness for our rebellion. We get freedom from self-righteous slavery when we submit to Jesus as Lord. Jesus is right. I'm wrong. Isn't it great? This is the gospel. This is the gospel that saves, and this is also the gospel that sustains. This is the gospel that gets you into the Christian life, that you need a Savior, and it's the gospel that continues the Christian life. Every day I need a Savior still, and I have one. Isn't Jesus great? 1 Peter 3.18 tells us this. Christ also suffered once for sin, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. Newsflash, you're a self-righteous idiot. It's in my notes. It says so, because so am I. But Jesus the righteous came, and he suffered in your place for the consequence of your rebellion. And he did this to bring you into relationship with the Father. Isn't that the best news? Why are you still set on being right? You're wrong. It's the best. Jesus was right in your place. And he did that to bring you to the Father. 1 Corinthians 1 tells us the same thing. Because of this, because of this gospel, because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in who? The Lord. You don't have to boast in yourself anymore. Boast in Jesus. You actually can now. You're free to say you're wrong. You're free to admit your failure to your spouse, to your friend, to your roommate, to your sibling. You're free to say I'm wrong because Jesus was right. And the best news is believing that you don't have to cling to your own rightness anymore because it doesn't get you anywhere. Actually, you get to cling to his rightness. He's right on your behalf and you can boast in Jesus now. Redemption of our self-righteousness is possible, church. Redemption of our self-righteous, deceiving, destroying, doubt-fueled self-righteousness is possible because of Jesus. I want to tell you something amazing because you might be thinking, man, I'm still a prideful jerk. Is it even possible for me to be freed from being so selfish? I ask that question every day, and so does my wife of me (laughs) because she loves me. It's possible. It's possible to be freed. Here's why we know this to be true. These brothers that were just dingbats, (laughs) these brothers that were doofuses trying to gaslight Jesus, their story didn't end with their self-righteousness. Acts 1.14 tells us that after the ascension of Christ, Jesus' brothers were there waiting and praying, and they received the Holy Spirit. The story didn't end with them being self-righteous dingbats. They actually ended up believing that he was the Messiah. They lowered their pride. They saw their need for a savior. They believed that their brother was the savior that he said he would be and was. And they actually put their faith in Christ. And here's what two of them said. James, one of the brothers of Jesus, said this in James 3.13. The wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere, What's James saying? A man who was changed by Jesus, who was not his brother, but was his savior. He's saying this, wisdom isn't me being right. Wisdom is from God. It doesn't control. It doesn't demand. It doesn't manipulate. It's full of peace. It's gentle. It's open to reason. It carries good fruit. It submits to the will, the way, and the glory of Jesus, and it produces fruit that looks like that. What if in your fights, what if in your conflicts, What if you were able to say, maybe I'm wrong, maybe my wisdom isn't right, but maybe God's wisdom is right. And true wisdom looks like me being gentle here. True wisdom looks like me being peaceable here. 
True wisdom looks like me being full of mercy here, not full of rightness here. True wisdom is impartial and sincere. James had a heart transformation where Jesus, Jesus, his brother, he became sin for James so that James could be free from sin. That's possible for us. Jude says it like this, another brother of Jesus. He ends his letter in a beautiful way, testifying to a changed heart, a changed life. James 1, or Jude 1.24. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now, and forevermore. Jude! The gaslighter, Jude, the manipulator, Jude, the controller. Jesus is glorious. He's majestic. He's dominant. He's in charge. Always has been, always is, always will be. Do you want to know what will kill your self-righteousness? That statement. He is right. I'm wrong. Isn't it great? He is God. I'm not. Isn't it free? He is majestic. I am tiny, and I need him every single hour. That's the best news. The best news. The way to kill our self-righteousness is to believe that, that that's who Jesus is. So here's the remedy as we get ready to wrap up. The remedy for my self-righteousness, it's easy. Look at this list. Acknowledge that Jesus is right. Admit that I've been wrong. Repent for my self-righteousness before God and others. Walk in humble dependence upon God's Son through God's Word by God's Spirit and repeat one to four every single day. Every day. Welcome to being a Christian. That's what it means. You don't actually advance in this Christian thing. You don't actually climb a ladder. If you're looking to get merit badges and to feel awesome about yourself, you're in the wrong place. We actually are here because we need Jesus. And we progress in the Christian life by his grace, by coming back to the cross every single day. And by his grace, through his spirit, we get changed to look more like Jesus from one degree of glory to another, not by pulling up our bootstraps, but by confessing of our sin and clinging to our Savior. Welcome to being a Christian. Have you forgotten? It's the best. This is the pathway of the Christian life. Big idea. My self-righteousness can be redeemed when it's submitted to Jesus' way, Jesus' will, and Jesus' glory over my own. I'm willing to bet that before we take communion that there's a conversation that needs to happen in this room where somebody goes to somebody who's wronged them and then has held that in their heart and says, I'm sorry for resenting you. That's sin. Will you forgive me? I know Jesus does. Let's take communion together. Have you considered in your conflicts that you might be wrong? Think about the loudest conflict in your life. Have you admitted your part in it yet? Oh boy, what a great opportunity to repent before God, before others, and to receive the righteousness of Jesus and to say, I'm wrong. It's the best. Jesus is right. Let's walk this out together in unity because we both need him real bad. That's what it looks like, church. What if this church was that place? What if the people of God were those people, these people, they were humble and dependent because they knew their sin, but even more so, they know their Savior. That's the Christian life, and that's the culture of the gospel life. That's what God's growing us to be, and I pray that we would walk in that for his glory. Now, we're going to wrap up with something super cheesy, <laughs> and then we'll take communion. Anybody born in the late 80s and grew up in the 90s? Great, awesome, nice. Born in 87, it was awesome. But I, the 90s is what I remember. I don't remember the 80s. I'm a 90s kid, and I'm going to close the sermon in the most 90s way possible. I am a millennial that grew up in church in the 90s, which means my jam in 1995 was DC Talk Jesus Freak in my mom's Dodge Caravan. <laughs> this is my jam. When I think about just the sweet spot, it's sitting in the Dodge Caravan with no AC, listening to a tape of Jesus Freak. Jill knows. This is from Jesus Freak, 1995, the song In the Light. This is the lyrics that have invaded my soul, and I pray that they invade yours and that you remember God's word in light of them. This is what the song says. This disease of self runs through my blood. It's a cancer fatal to my soul. 
Every attempt on my behalf has failed to bring this sickness under control. Tell me what's going on inside of me. What's going on? (laughs) I despise my own behavior. Despise my own behavior. This only serves to confirm my suspicions. What? That I'm still a man in need of a Savior. Lanessa knows. Lanessa knows. Church, every day you still need a Savior. And by God's grace, because of what he's done through his son, every day you have one. You're wrong. Jesus is right. Isn't it the best? I'm still a man in need of a Savior. Let's run to the table and remember that. Amen? Amen. Let me pray for us, and then I'll invite Trevor up to invite us to the communion table. Heavenly Father, thank you, thank you, thank you for sending your Son. Lord, apart from you intervening and apart from Jesus coming, we would be stewing in our self-righteousness, and we wouldn't even know it. And yet, you sent your Son to live humbly, rightly before you, rightly before others, to be perfect from his birthday to his death day, to satisfy the demands of righteous living that we couldn't live, to convict us and expose us and to show us a mirror for the fact that we are sinners apart from your saving grace. And then through his cross to give us a new nature where we're forgiven, where we're set free, where the record of wrong was canceled and now we're filled to live for your glory humbly walking in humility with brothers and sisters in Christ that need you too. Thank you, Jesus, for this Christian life you've invited us into and thank you for your son. Would we be quicker to repent of our wrongs? Would be, we be quick to place our faith in your son And we're thankful that redemption of self-righteousness is possible in Jesus. In his name, amen.